and welcome everybody. So um, I'm Roman, a lead engineer at Bluescape. And so I'm going to share uh, a little bit of the technical details on uh, our product, which is called the Bluescape wall, which you can see downstairs uh, next to the KDAB booth. Um, so <coughs> um, a little overview of what we're going to be talking about. Um, overall, the large scale display interfaces are kind of the a new, I would say, yeah, a new frontier in UX, not necessarily the, you know, the newest, but at least a new one. So I'll first go over what are some of the use cases and what has become possible in recent years due to the advances in technological, in terms of hardware, but also in terms of software support. Uh, I'll cover some of the challenges that go with that. Uh, I will talk a little bit about hardware considerations. We have gone through a certain amount of hardware combinations for our product, so this will be a little bit of you know, feedback and uh, lessons learned from the trenches in terms of what works and what doesn't work as well. And uh, since this is the Qt World Summit, I will of course talk a lot about how at Bluescape we are leveraging Qt for our product and how Qt allows us to push our software further and uh, opening up these new technologies on these new use cases. Um, so as you see, uh, Lil, as part of the little video playing, this is kind of an overview of what are the different use cases uh, that at least Bluescape can be used for. Um, that's not even regarding the cross-platform aspect of it, but at least when we look at the wall product itself, which is one of our offerings, um, <coughs> main use case, of course, is a digital canvas, right? The time for having whiteboards with dry erase markers in meeting rooms, that's, you know, 1995. This is, you know, 20 for, this is not 21st century. The 21st century, there shouldn't be anymore. What you should have in the meeting room is a digital tool, right? It could be virtual whiteboard, it could be touch screens, it could be whatever, but it's a digital canvas. The use cases, of course, are the education, uh, just like I said, whiteboard in classrooms, design as well. Uh, surprisingly, designers are still very, very um, reliant on printing their stuff and seeing their stuff in real life, um, real scale on walls and so on, to be able to stand and compare things side by side. Um, a lot of the use cases are storyboarding as well. Um, we, uh, we have one of uh, several customers in the... Um, in the media and, for example, the movie industry, for which uh, Bluescape allows them to create their storyboards and review their, you know, do scene design and code reviews and style reviews uh, for their projects, which could be media, it could be movies, it could be anything you want. A big, big part of it also is scientific visual visualization. You've seen a couple of examples uh, where you can, of course, use the same thing as a digital whiteboard where you are not bounded by the physical boundaries of the, bar of the whiteboard anymore, but you can go above and beyond. Uh, financial, uh, the financial um, industry also loves being able to see all these graphs and numbers and like big and standing next to each other. Um, and last but not least, what makes, at least in our case, Bluescape a very uh, powerful and very interesting proposition is the online collaboration thing. Now that you have a digital support for your data, you can also make that data persistent. You can make that data shared in the cloud in real time with others. So you don't have to only be standing at the wall. You could also have some t members in your team on their, br on their laptops remotely or on their tablets, and everybody can see and interact with the data in real time over the network. This is great for content reviews, where you could have teams, or maybe your manager is out on a trip. It's still able to go and look up and you know sign off on uh, on some designs. Um, high stake presentations as well. Um, more and more boards, you know, they yeah, like board meetings. Uh, they tend to you know like to have nice, you know, um, I would say um, uh, really, really. Um, um, 
like impressive presentations and so on. So instead of just having your little flipboard, you know, you can have these large screen displays where you have mo rich multimedia presentations. They actually love that, believe me. We have tons of those in board meeting rooms. Um, and finally, last but not least, yeah, ideation brainstorming. Same thing. Bring a bunch of people together, and just like people tend to gather around the whiteboard and scribble ideas and stuff, so have them do this. But instead of losing or having those, you know, stickers, please do not erase in your meeting rooms. You know, your data is there; it goes with you. You can go back to your desk, continue working on it, and so on. These are just a couple more examples covering what I just mentioned. So you can see uh, these are actually real use cases of a person who was doing some casts, uh, like basically filtering people for a casting as part of a movie. Uh, we have the scientific example in the top left corner. Uh, top center, you can see how you can integrate these. Uh, I was talking about you know, board meeting rooms and people like to have nice fancy rooms. So this is an example of a uh, wall, Bluescape wall integrated in, um, in a showroom in Chicago. Um, and finally, we have on the top right corner an example also of, I believe this is at some uh, design company. So what are the challenges in terms of UX for all this? Um, the big difference is you're not sitting at your desk anymore. When you're working on such a wall, you're standing. So this has a lot of impacts, um, positive and negative. But the positive impacts, for example, is you're free to use both of your hands. So you can now create user uh, interface and gestures and user interactions where you can use not only fingers on one hand, but also two fingers, at the, two hands at the same time. Uh, there's a proximity to display. So this uh, is uh, it's just something to be aware of, is that um, you're standing generally pretty close to the monitor. So that means you need to have a relatively good resolution. We, out of practice and experience, we know that up to 55 inches, uh, 1080p is OK. But once you start going above 55 inches, uh, 4K starts to be the minimum. Uh, there's a concept of uh, simultaneous users. As you can see on the right side, some of our configurations are arrays of displays that we can stack up to, we can do up to 24 monitors next, side by side, 55 inch each. Uh, so you can have three, four more people working next to each other. So that brings some interesting challenges such as who owns the data? Like if somebody changes or modifies something, and if you have the concept of you know user actions on your backend, uh, how can you identify who does what? If uh, you have the concept of selections or the concept of you know copy paste uh, specific to a user or login, for example, authentication, how uh, the challenges are? How are you going to manage to figure out? Well, you know. Are you going to divide up the space and say the user, this user is in the center, this user is on the left? That's a possibility. You can decide to do away with that completely. Bluescape chose to move away from that concept of compartmenting per user. And instead, we have the concept that in our workflow, there is no user interaction specific. The, the user is the workspace itself. And within the workspace, we don't really identify specific users. There are users that can access that data, but anybody within the workspace has like kind of like shared ownership, if you want. There's interesting UX challenges in terms of some of the, the UI that you can come up with is there's very few precedents. Um, when we are talking about how are you going to figure out you know, how to, to, to group objects or manipulate group of objects together, importing and exporting data, uh, when you're on a desktop application, you have guidelines. Microsoft has you know, guidelines. Apple has the guidelines for UIs. You, know, you have context menus. You have drag and drop. All these things are very standardized, and they have been proven over the, the course of time. When it comes to such UIs, there's actually very few examples out there. Um, the only one we kind of know of is the Microsoft with its Surface Hub, but it's itself more or less just a Surface tablet that's been blown up. So it does not necessarily answer all the questions. So that's both a blessing, technically, and for an engineer, it's a blessing, because you have almost unlimited creativity in what you can do. You can really come, with these, come up with all these ideas that some of them will be good, some of them won't be that good, but you get to really experiment and uh, try new things, which is great because you can just create your own guidelines. The downside or the flip side of that is that also means uh, sometimes simple things, you know, adding a simple 
dialogue, for example, for a standard action, you know, can end up taking a lot of time because uh, everybody will be saying, oh, I think it should be rather this way or it should be rather that way. And of course, you know, there's always going to be, and then there's always going to be people arguing that they want it one way or another. And then there is no real standard way of saying, well, this is what the Apple or Android guidelines say that we're going to do. So that can sometimes also complicate things a little bit during development. The technical challenges, the obvious one is the screen real estate, right? As I was showing uh, above, we can have arrays of uh, displays, up to 24 displays stitched together, each of them being a full HD monitor. So that means we have a total screen pixel area of 24K. So if you think of 4K for a, for a TV, we actually have 24K pixels that we have to push at 60 frames per second. So this is a huge, huge uh, challenge for us every day. And of course, combined with that, it's not only the amount of pixels, but it's you have to be able to put stuff within those pixels. So with the added area visible on the screen means also means added content that needs to be refreshed and repainted and re-rendered. So, uh, so as we'll see, we have the hardware that goes with that. A second thing is all of our displays, part of the Bluescape experience is we support finger interaction, but we also support pen interaction. So every Bluescape display comes with a pen, and it's just like a natural whiteboard. You can write on it, and you can also touch it with your fingers. So the writing experience is actually a pretty tricky one. You have to be extremely accurate and extremely fast because the slightest imprecision or the slightest delay between your hand's movements and the time that the writing actually appears on the screen, the strokes, um, can ruin the writing experience. So it's especially hard as your displays get bigger because then again, you have to be able to push the pixels as fast as possible. And of course, data scalability. With these large displays, people expect to be able to put a lot of data. And it's every single decision that we have to make during the development part is a challenge because every s decision that should be simple, you always have to think about, wait, you know, what if users start to put, you know, 100,000 images in the workspace? And we've actually had customers trying to do that. So we need to be able to keep the boundaries. We have the concept, we, we, we use the concept of infinite workspace. In theory, it's of course, well, in practice, in theory, it's infinite, but in practice, it's never infinite. You're always bounded by the physical boundaries of your hardware. Um, but we have to be able to make use of these boundaries, you know, push them as far as possible and make the experience for the user as good as possible. If we can display terabytes of data in a workspace, um, fine, but if it's gonna take two hours to load, then that's not gonna be okay. So we need to be able to push as much data as possible as fast as possible, which as you can imagine, he heavily relies on multi-threading and you know, parallel processing. So, as I was saying, we don't use your mama's computer, right? We don't have that thing plugged into a MacBook. Uh, we use serious hardware. Um, for single display configs, actually up to a screen like that, we actually just get away with a pretty simple, it's a high-end gaming machine, is essentially. So it's basically a machine with a good CPU, uh, professional grade processor, we, a GPU. We are using the NVIDIA Quadro Professional Series. Uh, which has eight gigabytes of RAM, and we just accompanied that with a yeah a serious Core i7 processor for the cores, and then 16 gigs of RAM. But where it gets more interesting is the large scale. Uh, the, yeah, the the single uh, display config doesn't scale more than 4K. Um, for the large scale displays, like I said, you know, 16, 20 uh, full screen uh, stitched together. We have to go to professional grade workstations where we have like you know, dual processor. And the interesting part is then we start having to, we start putting more than one GPU. We actually, the high end, the, the, we have up to four GPUs for some of the machines that are um, powering the biggest displays. Which brings up to, so of course it gives you up to 32 gigs of video RAM, but uh, then you also have, as we'll see later on, complications in how you're making use of these four GPUs at the same time. 
a little bit about the touch screens. Uh, like I said, we've been shipping the product. It's our third year at Bluescape. And before that, we started with, uh, it was a partnership with a company called Obscure Digital, which for those of you who have seen the new Salesforce uh, building in downtown, they have this very nice um, waterfall digital display in their lobby downstairs. Uh, that's in San Francisco. It's the Obscure Digital who actually made that. And it is made of you know screens that are stitched together. Um, in our case, we want interaction. So we have evaluated several um, alternatives for displays. The first case is the simple capacitive touch screens, right? So basically think of your tablet screen, but blown up. Um, so they go all the way to 65 uh, inches. And uh, the latest ones are also able to push 4K. So they have 4K resolutions. Uh, overall, it's the same as the tablet experience. It's usually pretty, it's, they're relatively cheap, all things considered. Uh, the touch is usually pretty good. Not as precise on the small ones, but pretty OK. And they, a lot of them also have things like pen, automatic pen detection based on the size of the touch point. They would also do angle for some of them, pressure, and so on. So they're usually good round displays. But the big issue, or like the big limitations with them, is you can't really scale them beyond 65 inches. The capacitive touch uh, frame just does not go beyond that. They're starting to have like physical hardware issues after that. So when we want to go further up, um, I was, oh, the other issue is they have large bezels. I don't know why, but at least we have not been able to find a single capacitive display from any brand that does not come with those, like, you know, f two inches thick bezels, which makes it impossible to stack them in an array. So when we do need to have these uh, stacked uh, uh, configurations, right now we are using a company, it's a Finnish company, called um, Multitaction who creates 55-inch uh, monitors with a touch layer on top of them. And uh, they have a very thin bezel, so we can stack them together. And they are also very well made for this sort of configuration. So here, it's not capacitive touch, but instead, they use an infrared, an array of infrared cameras all around the screen. And they detect touch based on the infrared uh, that your body emits, uh, light that your body emits. And for the pen detection, they also use pens with a special infrared LED. So. It's, um, so that makes that technology work. Unfortunately, it does not work very well at all. It has huge problems, especially in terms of what we call hovering, which means sometimes it will detect a touch just because your hand is a little too close. If you're not even touching the monitor and it already registers it as a touch. So it's, it's nice for those big, large display configurations, but unfortunately the touch is very, very finicky. They require um, calibration of, and the calibration often goes off. They are also prone to something very interesting, which is light rays. Um, so if you are in a meeting room where you can potentially have the sun that somehow has the sun rays coming through the day as the sun is setting usually, uh, it will trigger, it will think that there are like pens that are writing on the wall. So we've had cases of customers complaining that in the morning, they came in and their workspaces were full of like lines that came out of seemingly out of nowhere, only for us to realize that it was at every time by us analyzing the time of the day, we realized it was the sun setting that would then hit the screens at a specific angle, which was detected. So reliability issues, reliability issues. Um, oh, I missed one here. So there's also. Another alternative which we like, it's touch frame overlays. So a company like PQ Labs, who basically sells that frame you could put on a TV like that or a monitor like this, you can outfit on top of it. And that frame is basically a matrix of laser beams and it does touch detection when your finger touches the surface, the laser get cut and so that's how they can triangulate the, the finger position. It works pretty well. It does pen detection as well because it can detect the size of the touch. And what's great about those is they scale up to 120 inches. So we are able to outfit them on very large single display 4K configurations, and that works for many of our customers. Um, the main issue with that solution is that as good as their technology is, by the fact that it's an overlay, um, that introduce uh, an extra layer of depth between the pixels, frame, the pixels and the, the touch panel. And so that creates what we call the parallax effect, which is the fact that you're not really touching the screen. There's always some depth. So it's fine as long as you're facing. But if you start to especially write or touch something that's not in front of you, 
what you think will be touching will be detected as slightly with a slight offset, right? Because the, there is a distance between the pixels and where you're touching. So that can be frustrating, especially on large displays. But they're getting better at it every time there's a new, you know, they have a new version. And finally, a few alternatives such as hybrid solutions. There's a company called FlatFrog, which is trying to mix capacitive and laser grid, if I understood correctly what they are doing. So that actually seems pretty promising, and we've started testing those more and more, but it's still very early, so we are not exactly sure if this will work on the long term. And as you may have heard, there's also the, uh, another alternative is projector arrays. So you can use short, um, short uh, range projectors and the thing then is you need an array, you need more than one because the problem with the projector, if, especially if it's behind you, is that if you're blocking the light, then you don't see what's in front of you anymore. So it can either be behind and back projection or array of projectors so that there's always some light coming through. Anyway, <clears throat> so back to the Qt level now. Um, how do we leverage the touch support? Um, Qt actually surprisingly makes this very easy. Uh, there's plugins that can be used no matter what. So they are QPA, Clue Platform Abstraction plugins, but they can be used no matter what. You could use them even on a regular X or Windows or Mac, actually as a, not Windows because those are Linux specific. But even if you're running a standard X application, you can make use of these plugins. There's uh, FDEV Touch, which is based on the standard Linux input event interface. So this basically, talks directly to the input devices that are provided by the Linux kernel. It's usually s really, really well supported, like most of the touch hardware is compatible with it, so that makes it very easy to integrate new hardware. And it automatically handles, the, the, the protocol itself handles multi-touch, so that integrates very nicely. Uh, for pen support, it's a separate plugin, it's called FDEV Tablet. Um, it's also based on the Linux input interface, but it's the pen or tool counterpart, uh, which was historically used for Wacom tablets, and as you know. Um, but it's now also what most touchscreens use to, um, to, to, I would say, to, to propagate the, when you're writing with the pen, they will basically create special tablet devices, which you can then hook up your application as well. Then we've got uh, Tuyo. So Tuyo is interesting. Tuyo is what's used by multi -taction. It's a network-based protocol. So instead, you connect, there is a network uh, Ethernet cable at the back of your display, and this uh, is able to output UDP, UDP messaging on a specific Tuyo protocol to your application. It sounds strange, but it's actually pretty good. There's very low latency, and it's uh, much more convenient when you have these arrays of monitors because each of them has assigned an assigned port, so you can have each monitor send its m touch data to a separate UDP port, and it's very easy for you to map then which port maps to where in your geographical or in your physical space. So you can do mapping of coordinates between monitors. Um, so if you're interested, yeah, there's, you can make use of those two ways with Qt. You can either have them loaded via the command line, so you can pass the dash plugin option, which is recognized by QCore, a QGUI application itself, and extracted from your arguments, and then the name of the plugin you want to load. So you can, without modifying your application, add support for the touch. Or you can also uh, hard code it in your application as part of the initialization sequence, for example. So the classes are available through QPlatform support. So QFDEV Touch Manager, Q2Yo Ender, and you can pass the same. You can, of course, pass arguments like we do for Tuyo Touch here, uh, such as the name of the port you want to use. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the display side now, because I'm running short, but anyway. Um, the key, of course, is hardware accelerated rendering. There's no way you're going to be able to push 24K pixels at a 60 frames per second using the CPU. So here, are the, uh, the CPU only, at least. So in this case, you want to maximize GPU usage as much as you want. That means Qt Quick 2, Qt OpenGL, Qt 3D if you want. Avoid Qt Painter, Qt Graphics, and Qt Quick 1, which are all raster-based, the old CPU APIs, right? If you really have to, you can actually have those render in a side thread into an off-screen surface texture and then blend those textures on the screen. At least this is asynchronous in this way and it won't slow down your general uh, event loop. Um, <clears throat> the various alternatives uh, that you can use, um, if you have a single display, single process, full screen application, EGL FS uh, is the simplest one. It works well on Linux. Wayland. Um, I've learned today that it's not single display anymore. Our friends from KDAB down in the Qt exhibition area actually have a very nice example of a multi-display application that they have made where it's using Wayland uh, with two separate displays. 
And this is a simple window manager which allows you to have multiple processes, uh, processes composited. And uh, finally, what we are using at Bluescape still for now is good old X11, making sure that you have all the hardware acceleration, so DRI and GLX support, so that everything is hardware accelerated, compositing, and rendering, tightly integrated with the graphics driver. Um, this supports multi-display, and as we will see, also multi-GPU, and of course, multiple process. So how do you deal with multiple GPUs? Yeah. Um, the trick, at least on Linux, is that you have to use Multi you create multiple displays in your X configuration and you assign one GPU per display as part of the X configuration. Then when you create your application, you will create one process for each of the displays and the process that the display you create your process on gets assigned to that GPU. The rendering and also any OpenGL context or any uh, GL resources that you're creating will be going to that particular GPU. So in the case of the 3x4, this is how we do it. We have three slave renderers. The first one is created, so in the 3x4 setup, we have one virtual display that goes from the top row, one virtual display for the middle row, and one virtual display for the third row. Each assigned a different CPU, and we do then, so in this case, as you'll see, we do the rendering. Uh, we do have to have the rendering per, C, per GPU, and we have to have a master that coordinates those so that you don't see tearing or things like that. All right. All right. We're um, going to be stopping here. Yeah, good.